morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Thursday, January 6th, 2022. And today I'm doing a bit of a retake of a show that I've done a bunch of times over the last three plus years. That is talking about strategy, not just, uh, you know, talking tough and looking good on the Internet, but actually talking about strategy that can help effectively nullify federal gun control in practice, on the ground, real concrete steps that need to be taken. It's so important that I think it's worth revisiting time and time again. And hopefully each time I do this, I get a little bit better at it. And every time I do an episode, I get feedback and ideas on how to improve things. Even when people aren't even thinking like, oh, you got to improve that. Just the conversation keeps improving our strategy over time. And we need to get better and better at this because there's tons of gun control all over the place. So on this episode... I want to briefly highlight four essential principles, four essential steps that need to be taken to get the ball rolling on nullifying federal gun control. And while I'm also against all the state level gun control as well, the strategy there is actually different. How to deal with the states is very different than how to deal with the feds in most situations. And it's actually not my expertise. So I want to focus on something that I'm good at. And I've got some quotes from the founders. We're going to focus on things like natural rights. We can revisit some steps uh, on refusal to cooperate, resistance, noncompliance, and then some legislation in the states that have passed last year and that we're looking at pending at the beginning of the 2022 legislative session. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. And it's not always Monday, Wednesday, and Friday like this week. It's Monday, Thursday, Saturday. I've had a few days off spending time with my nephews who came out to visit. I haven't seen them in quite some time outside of a, a Zoom chat online. So it was really, really good to be able to spend some time with them. And I'm just playing a little bit catch up and I'm really glad to be able to do this show today. Thank you for being here on an off day normally. Uh, we, on the show homepage, it's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. There you're gonna find all the archives of the show for well over three years. We're closing in on four pretty soon. You can find all the different platforms we're on. We live stream on the mainstream ones like YouTube and Facebook and uh, Twitter and Twitch and LinkedIn. We also live stream at the decentralized censorship resistant odyssey.com. That's my favorite video platform right now, odyssey.com. It's just spelled out like that. We also archive our videos over at places like Gab TV and MeWe and BitChute and Brighteon, uh, BitTube and Hyper, all over the place. And we also have the audio-only podcast edition uh, everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, uh, TuneIn, Amazon, Podbean, everywhere you can think of. If you need another platform that we're not on, please do let me know, whether in the comments or an email at team at 10th Amendment Center .com. And of course, there's also our membership program that you'll find there. Nothing helps us do this work more every single day than the financial faith and support of our members. Thank you so much for those of you who are with us already. And if you're considering doing that, it just starts out at two bucks a month. You can find that all on the show homepage, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Just a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat while we allow people another minute or two. The mainstream platforms can be uh, good at some stuff, but they tend to be a little slow on these live stream notifications. So I want to say hello while we allow people Another minute or so to get those notifications. There's Tim Martin in Arizona. Always good to see you, buddy. John Hume, Dixie Strong, 64 in Alabama. We got a few bills that you got to follow and support there in Bama. Haji, 54 in Michigan. Patricia Dance, Gun Eyes, Sharon Patriot, Tyler B., Philip Lavery, Sin Nombre. That's a cool name. Uh, there's Sharon Patriot again. Joe Got Zucked. That's a fun one. Screen names always, always get me to pause. Anyways, Gun A, Kirk Jones. Harry Elzo or Izo SR and everyone else. I apologize if I missed anybody, but I'll look back in the chat a little bit later in the show or later on today and see if I can respond to some questions or comments. But let's get right to this. And I want to first start out with three quotes from the founders, from leading founders and old revolutionaries that I think do a pretty good job of summarizing some of the core principles behind our strategy. If we're going to take on the largest government, the largest empire in the history of the world, we really should consider the strategy that the people used to successfully defeat the largest government, the largest empire in the history of the world at that time. Against all odds, David versus Goliath. That's what we're facing once again. Certainly, if not even more difficult. So let's start out with some strategy from people who know how to get things done. 
We'll start, of course, with the father of the American Revolution that I cite all the time. I mean, episode after episode, I keep bringing this up because it's so foundational to our work, Samuel Adams. The truth is, all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. And it'll make sense as I go through these four essential steps and principles that need to be used on the ground by people in their minds and by their actions in order to defeat federal gun control, because it's a one-two punch. You have to not just... Uh, you have to not just value the freedom, but you have to know how to defend it. You don't have to just know how to defend it. You have to know what you're defending. So it's a really, really important one-two punch that we can get. That was in his great uh, Candidas essay in the uh, Boston Gazette in October of 1771, Samuel Adams, to start out. Then next up, we have, if I can get my screens working here right, here's Thomas Jefferson writing to the Reverend Charles Clay, one that I haven't mentioned in a while, but it's a very, very important one. Jefferson recognized that you don't go from point A, living under the yoke of tyranny, under total prohibition and control, to a land of liberty in one fell swoop. Anyone trying to tell you they can get you there, anyone, and I've started to see some conservative email organizations sending stuff out like, hey, we've got the silver bullet. These people are all grifters and scammers, guaranteed. No one has a silver bullet. This is going to take a lot of work. It's going to take millions of people, and it may take generations, to be honest with you. It's very unfortunate where we are, where our uh, where our predecessors have left us by turning a blind eye to the Constitution and liberty to our natural rights, and so many people alive today hate them. So we've got a lot, a lot of work to do, but I believe it's our duty, our moral duty, to make a stand, to start setting the foundation to get the ball rolling. Here's how Jefferson put it. He said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We must be contented to secure what we can get from time to time and eternally press forward for what is yet to get. Because, Jefferson said, it takes time to persuade men to do even what is for their own good. Sometimes they know it's for their own good and they're afraid because it takes work. It takes risk. It takes courage and backbone. And sometimes they're just clueless. And of course, when you live in a society that's dominated by government-run uh, education, we've got a lot of clueless people. We've got a lot of sociopaths out there. We've got a lot of really, really nasty people that are really against anything that's good. So it's going to take some time. And the number three is very similar. This is from the penman of the revolution, and we actually have this phrase on our membership cards, which I actually finally have one handy. Now that I have a new setup here, it's easy to reach things a little bit uh, a little bit easier. This is John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, and he wrote in his at uh, the signature of his first letter from a farmer in Pennsylvania in 1767 against the hated Townsend Acts, Concordia, and I always butcher this, even with help, Concordia res parve crescunt. This means crescunt. It means small things grow great by concord. I am terrible at Latin, but I'm going to do my best. Small things grow great by concord. It's very similar to what Jefferson's talking about. The ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. And each of those inches that you reach, they grow greater when other people join in. When people see a little success, you get more. And we've seen this play out in some issues. We want to see it play out on defending the natural right to keep and bear arms. And with that, I think it's absolutely essential. 100% essential, because if we're looking at what Samuel Adams had to say, you have to value freedom and defend it as you ought, and then you'll be free. We have to start out with the foundational principle that you absolutely do not have a constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Not at all. You don't have Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. You don't have Second Amendment rights. You just have rights. You have a natural right to keep and bear arms. That means you have it because you exist, not because it's written in some document. There was no one at the time of ratification. There was no one at the time of the debate over the Bill of Rights, whether it should even be included, that thought if there wasn't a Second Amendment that no one had the right to keep and bear arms. This is a natural right from our Creator, our birthright, from God, however you want to describe it, whatever works for you, but it's not from government. It's not liberty if it comes from government. It's not a right. It's a privilege. It's a gift from government. So with that... Let me pull up a couple of other quotes to focus on this a little bit here from Mercy Otis Warren. Huh, there it is. Okay, Mercy Otis Warren, the muse of the American Revolution. She put it this way. Self-defense is a primary law of nature, which no 
no subsequent law of society can abolish. So even if they put a law on it and it abolishes it in the law, it's not really law according to the founders and old revolutionaries. And it's only law if the people allow it to be law. So it's up to the people to defend their constitution. I had a quote, maybe I'll have time at the end, but there's a quote again from John Dickinson writing in his Fabius Letters in 1788 talking about how it's the duty of the people to ensure that their constitution is enforced. It's not, <laughs> if you leave it to the government to enforce against itself, you're going to have a really, really bad problem. So again, self-defense is a primary law of nature. It's a natural right. It's not a gift from government. And here from St. George Tucker, the great jurist and legal mind who wrote the view of the Constitution of the United States in 1803, the first extended legal commentary on the document. Jefferson thought it was incredibly important, and he put it this way. The right of self-defense is the first law of nature. First law of nature. Again, natural rights. And now next, moving forward to the Constitution, I know a lot of people want to focus on the Second Amendment, and that's incredibly important, but surprise, surprise, here you are listening to a, a podcast from the Tenth Amendment Center or watching a video, and I'm going to remind you of the Tenth Amendment. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. We take the position, first of all, that all gun control is a violation of of your natural right to keep and bear arms, all, at any level, in any country, anywhere on earth. But we're not trying to protect people everywhere on earth, that we're not the policemen of the world, but just we're starting with that foundational principle. And then two, on top of it, and this isn't gonna be an episode discussing every clause of the Constitution necessary and proper and general welfare and commerce and the Second Amendment and all that other stuff, but really there is no power delegated to the federal government for gun control, there's nothing. There's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes any of it. That means the number of federal gun control measures that are authorized by the Constitution to the federal government is this number, zero, none. Not one is authorized. That includes the National Firearms Act of 1934, the Gun Control Act of 1968, its amendments in 1986, the Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988, and, of course, the bump stock ban of 2018. I've had some people tell me, oh, the courts got rid of that. That's nonsense. It's still there. And just last month in December, we learned that there, you know, there was a, some kind of a split decision on something. I don't really spend a lot of time looking at the courts because going to federal courts to limit federal power is a dumb strategy. Dumb strategy. Sharon Patriot, I just happened to look over in the chat, saw a great comment. People cannot defend what they have no knowledge of. Well, sometimes they can be helpful here and there, but when they have no knowledge of it and they're taking a leadership role or they suck at it or they think that a Second Amendment president is someone who just enforces all the gun control laws on the books right now, these are really, really dangerous, dangerous people. It's very important that people understand that our rights are natural rights. They're not gifts from government. So that's the foundational stuff that we have to start with. And now we have our four steps, our four pillars of what needs to be done to uh, actually nullify the federal gun control in practice and effect rather than just talk about it. Of course, and the first step really is to recognize that people have to understand the, that the right to keep and bear arms is a natural right, that all federal gun control not only violates that natural right, but it also violates the Constitution as well. That's number one. We have to have an education campaign. Samuel Adams talked about action and education in that, in that essay in uh, 1771. All might be free if they value freedom. They first have to understand it, and then we have to convince people that it is of value to them to be free, and then they have to know how and take action on how to defend it. So step one is we have to actually have an education campaign on the right to keep and bear arms. It's not a constitutional right. It's just not a Second Amendment right. The Second Amendment is not your gun permit. You are. Let's start with that. Number two, people need to be willing to exercise their rights. And this is where a lot of people kind of tend to back down. We hear so much, so often, and it really just makes me cringe, my skin crawl. I get so pissed off about it. When I see gun rights organizations, most of them are bad, in my opinion, because most of them think that the only thing that you should ever do is spend all of your money supporting lawsuits in the federal government to protect rights. It's, that seems to be the bulk of it. But even the, the better ones, they tend to... Well, 
they tend to shy away from exercising our rights, whether government wants us to or not. That's number two. And they tell us things like, well, law abiding citizens should have the right to keep and bear arms. Well, we're not concerned. We're... <laughs> If only law-abiding citizens have a natural right to keep and bear arms, all government has to do is keep passing laws, and then if they pass laws that violate your natural rights, and then you don't follow those because you're doing what the founder said, which is exercise your rights anyways, you're no longer a law-abiding citizen. Stop. we got to stop with that approach. We have to start with that natural rights foundation. So let's go to the next quotes here from James Otis Jr. writing, I think this is Freeborn American in 1767. He said, there is nothing that will destroy liberty more than a prevailing opinion that it is better tamely to submit than nobly assert and vindicate our privileges. Ex expanding liberty, stopping government prohibition, stopping government gun control. That is not going to happen by complying with it. We hear this all the time on other issues today. You're not going to comply your way out of this mess. That doesn't mean stick your neck out and risk death at every single turn. But we have to at least start with that understanding that if we're going to just tamely submit and wait for government to fix itself, that is guaranteed to destroy liberty. We need to have some backbone for resistance. Here's Thomas Jefferson in 1774 with a very similar viewpoint. He said, a free people, and this is a paraphrase, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as the gift of their chief magistrate. And this is really kind of just a one-two punch. It's like Samuel Adams was right off the bat. We're talking about it's a natural right, and then you don't wait for government to tell you it's okay. So you don't wait for a government permission slip. You don't wait for government to repeal the law. You don't wait for government courts to tell you, well, that stuff that they've been telling you you can't do for so many years. I mean, if you think about the bump stock ban, which was in 2018, and then you were supposed to turn in or destroy your uh, your self-defense weapon. And I know a lot of more of the, the real hardcore gun rights enthusiasts will say this is a kiddie toy, but that's not up to me to say. And that's pretty arrogant. And in fact, it's very dangerous to say, well, I don't use this, so I don't care. I mean, those people are really, really bad. They're very bad. If you just think that's, that it's okay, we can turn a blind eye to it because you don't use it, you're as much of a problem, you're as much of a Tory as everyone else that's trying to attack our rights. Because you're, in essence, you're okay. If you turn a blind eye to something, you're doing the same. You encourage it, as Samuel Adams put it, and you involve others in our doom. So a free people claim their rights. That's Thomas Jefferson. That's number two. People have to be willing to exercise their rights, no matter what government has to say. And then number three, if I can pull up my screen here, just getting used to the setup. Number three is a refusal to cooperate with officers of the Union. James Madison in Federalist 46 gave us the strategy, the blueprint on how to defeat any federal program. And that is included four steps. One was a refusal to cooperate with officers of the Union on a state, a local. Well, local would be part of the state because those are political subdivisions and on an individual level. Roger Sherman had a very similar view in a letter in December of 1787 we don't actually know who he wrote this to, but we have we have the documents. He said, all acts of the Congress not warranted by the Constitution would be void. So it's void in practice. It's void in theory. It's void in principle. But he recognized, just like everyone else at the time, but today, for some reason, it seems that a lot of people think you could just wave a document at government and just explain to them how they've been wrong, that they'll just back off. This is just nonsense. This is doomsday kinds of garbage. Roger Sherman understood that even though something should be void in theory under the Constitution, the government itself would still try to enforce it. So he said, nor, he said, well, let me read the whole thing in context here so it makes more sense. All acts of the Congress not warranted by the Constitution would be void, nor could they be enforced contrary to the sense of a majority of the states. Sherman recognize that government would still, the, the general government, the central, the federal government would still try to enforce stuff that it was not supposed to do. And how you stop it is being contrary. The states have to be contrary to that. And that's uh, just a little bit more eloquent than how we generally put things today. So refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. I covered that whole strategy in some detail in an episode last October Partnerships don't work when half the team quits. We know for a fact, the federal government has talked about it as a fact, 
that states and, in fact, the National Governors Association specifically sent out a letter to members of Congress years ago as a fact that states are partners with the federal government on most federal programs. We know that whether the prohibition is on a plant or on a self-defense tool, that the enforcement action is done as a partnership between a federal agency and local law enforcement. In general, if there's an ATF bust, you're going to find maybe a couple of ATF agents on the ground and 20 or 30 local sheriffs, local PD, 50, whatever the numbers may be, and it is a partnership. So if you drop the partnership, you stop participating, you use Madison and Sherman's advice, a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union, there's not much they can do to force these so-called laws, regulations, and mandates down our throats. So uh, this episode is very important to check out. I will link to it in the show notes. There have been two states so far. I mean, there's more, but there are two states that have gotten the ball rolling on this part of it in a pretty significant way. And if you follow this show, you know about them already. Probably you've heard me talk about it so much. It may be too much, but it's never enough, really. First of all, in Missouri last year, the Second Amendment Preservation Act was signed into law. It took us eight years to get that thing passed. We've been supporting that effort for eight years. There's tons of really hardcore activists on the ground in Missouri that push that over the top. Uh, we can especially thank Ron Calzone of Missouri First, who is a tireless warrior for the Constitution of Liberty and almost always uses a Tenth Amendment approach. This guy is amazing. So that bans the state from enforcing a lot of federal gun control. It is not everything at all, but it is a huge step forward. And we're already seeing a lot of complaints by some local law enforcement agencies or lobby groups saying, well, this is hamper hamstringing our ability to partner on joint task forces with the federal government. And yes, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. And we should expect that complaint. But this is, I will link to an article on that so you can read about it, learn more, and then encourage your own state to take the same type of action. And then a similar bill, but a little bit more narrow, not as detailed, but could be just as effective, possibly more. We'll just have to see how it plays out was signed into law in Arizona. It went into effect in September, House Bill 2111. That also banned a bunch of stuff that's federal gun control. And so now in both Missouri and in Arizona, the, the focus really needs to be on repealing state laws. But I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Here's a couple of other states with legislation that's pending for 2022. In New Hampshire, House Bill 1178 would ban the state from participating in enforcement of most federal gun control. Similar in the approach to what it has already happened in Arizona and Missouri. So people in New Hampshire definitely want to get behind that. And then there's five bills. I know I mentioned to Dick Street, Dixie in the chat earlier at the beginning of the show, there's some legislation in Alabama. There's actually five bills. So there's a lot. There's a flurry of legislators who want to be on the winning side because there must be a lot of grassroots pressure. We know Bama Carey is a great organization down there. They have been really pushing for this kind of stuff. They've been pushing for permitless carry, the constitutional carry, whatever you want to call it. I prefer permitless. I'm making it a New Year's resolution to stop referring to it as constitutional carry, but permitless carry in Alabama. And then they've also been working to try to get to ban the state from helping the feds enforce federal gun control as well, which is incredibly important. So they're leading the way on that. And there's five bills that have been filed. The ones that we seem to think, at least in Mike Meharry's report from December, my birthday, December 1st, 2021, House Bill 7 and Senate Bill 2. So we'll be following that through the legislative session. So those are some bills. We're watching a few others in some other states like Kentucky, Oklahoma, and Mississippi, probably a few more in the coming weeks as well. And so that's number three, a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. And then the fourth one, we have to repeal the state laws as well. You have to repeal the state level gun control, whether it's the state prohibitions that mirror federal prohibitions, that happens all over the place, like suppressors or bump stocks or whatever, ghost guns, whatever they want to call that. We see those state-level restrictions on your natural right to keep and bear arms often mirroring, sometimes more aggressive, sometimes less, but mirroring the federal. So we have to get rid of those. In Texas, for example, last year, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. They removed the prohibition on, uh, I believe it was sound suppressors, right? So this is, or maybe it was, um, yeah, they call them silencers, right? So that that's a step forward in Texas. So that's very important. Or maybe removing permit requirements. Everyone calls it constitutional carry. I prefer NRA. I'm no fan of, but they generally call it permitless carry. I want to follow their lead on that. 
supporting open and concealed carry, reciprocity, basically everything. Get rid of gun control on the state level. The more you create an environment, and if you think about this, the more that you create an environment that's friendly to a natural right to self-defense, to a natural right to keep and bear arms, the more difficult it is for the federal government to enforce what they have on the books already, and then on top of it, implement new stuff. So if the federal government tries to prohibit people people from doing the stuff that they want to do, that they're willing to do, that they are doing, that everyone sees people doing peacefully and successfully, it's not very easy for government to pull that off. So it creates an environment where you create a uh, kind of a, a gun rights sanctuary on a state level that really creates an environment that's also very hostile to federal gun control. So really, to defeat federal gun control, you also have to defeat state-level gun control. And we've seen this play out in practice on things like alcohol prohibition when the states refused to implement the Volstead Act. This played out. We know how that ended. They ended up having to uh, pass an amendment to repeal because it wasn't getting enforced. We know, for example, uh, I think it was Mayor LaGuardia at one point even said, we don't even know how uh, how alcohol prohibition would work because it's never really been enforced. Either that or it was maybe a senator from Maryland, Senator Bruce. But ba you get the idea. If it's not been enforced, there's nothing they can do. Eventually, they're going to back down to save face. So we've also seen this play out in more modern times on things like cannabis and hemp. And at the end of the day, the feds do not have the resources to get the job done when people are exercising their rights openly and peacefully in their own area, in their own state. So in summary, here's the four steps, the four pillars that need to be taken. One, the right to keep and bear arms is a natural right. Natural right. It's not a gift from government. It's not a constitutional right. It's not a Second Amendment right. It's your right. Two, people have to be willing to exercise that right even if the government tells them they're not allowed to. You have to a free people claim their rights is how Thomas Jefferson put it. Number three, we need a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union on a state, local, and individual level. And then number four, we have to repeal the state laws as well. So you got to get it from all different angles. Defeating federal gun control means defeating state gun control. Defeating state gun control means defeating federal gun control. It is all very much intertwined. And even though you'll never find me saying that all state and local gun control are a violation of the federal gun control, Constitution. Instead, there are violations in general, except maybe Illinois and poor, those poor souls like me here in California, state constitutions. It is always a violation of your natural right to keep and bear arms. It's a violation of your humanity. And I think I do have just one more moment to mention this quote that I said right off the bat from John Dickinson writing in his Fabius letters, he, Fabius number four. He's talking about the supreme sovereignty of the people. Sovereignty meaning final authority. He said it is their duty, the people's duty, to watch and their right to take care that the Constitution be preserved. He didn't say that it is the government's right or duty to take, well, it is their duty, but he knew that power would always seek to expand. Everyone knows that power grows and if it goes unchecked, and it can't check itself, it will always expand. So it is the duty and the right of the people to preserve their own constitution. This is an assertion of sovereignty, final authority in the people. He said, or in the Roman phrase, on perilous occasions, to provide that the republic receive no damage. The people of the several states have absolutely failed on that for a long, long, long time. And when we're talking about federal gun control, not as long as on some other things. We're talking about since 1934. And there's some other ones that I missed in between as well. But it's pretty bad. And we got a lot, a lot of work to do. Let me take a look over in the live chat and see if there's any um, questions or comments that I can get people uh, get from uh, the chat here. Kirk Jones says, unarmed, you are a subject. Armed, you're a citizen. George Washington at one point, he said, free people always need to be armed. You're, you you can't, you can't stay free without the ability to defend your freedom. Samuel Adams talked about this in the Rights of the Colonists, Boston Town Meeting publication that was very important document for uh, before the Declaration of Independence, and basically he talked about our natural rights to life, liberty, and property, but the means to defend them. You can't have those rights without the means to defend them. There's Sharon Patriot says our rights do not come from the government. 
a fuzz T fork said maybe the Supreme Court should read the Federalist Papers. And I think they read it too much. I need to do an episode on this because if you focus the meaning of the Constitution solely on the Federalist Papers, then what you're doing is you're drifting towards everything about the Constitution comes from Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. And although two of those three did some very good things, one of them, it's very easy to be like, well, if... If we're going to the Federalists to define the Constitution, then a lot of what Hamilton had to say about it in later years, like uh, the Necessary and Proper Clause, creating the First National Bank, that's also valid. So I want to actually avoid that approach. I also want to avoid going to the Supreme, the federal courts to define the federal Constitution. Natural Responsibility says, Howard, this is up to us. If we do not defend our constitution, our liberty, it is shameful. We posted a quote, or maybe it's later scheduled later today on our social channels from um, from Benjamin Franklin. He said, like, if we do not defend our rights, we, we are going to be looked upon with disdain for the next century to come, not just in this country. And this was a letter in 1775, but for the for the centuries to come. So it really, it is up to us. There is no greater blessing than to be able to stand for liberty at its moment of maximum danger. And you are the generation to do that. We all are, and maybe even the next one might be worse, but for the time being, it is worse than it ever has been. John Hume is absolutely correct. SCOTUS is a political court. Don't trust them. Now, we're happy when they get something right. We're happy when they get something right, and we want to encourage them to get something right. And we also want them to put good people there. They don't. Even the ones that you think might be good, are not. They all have some very bad problems. Scalia, for example, a lot of uh, conservatives worship this guy like he's some kind of a lesser deity of some sort. But he had no problem expanding the Commerce Clause and giving the federal government extra power because it violated the uh, conservative, the Republican political viewpoint that cannabis should be kept illegal. So he was happy to use an FDR-era precedent in Wickard versus Filburn to give the federal government power over something grown and kept in, in your own backyard and never bought or sold as somehow being interstate commerce. And then a few years later, we were point out, pointed out that uh, uh, we learned that in the Obamacare case, they basically cited Scalia to help protect Obamacare. Uh, Fuzz also said most judges did not study the Constitution. In fact, most lawyers did not. That is absolutely correct. I totally agree with that. They do not know anything about it. Uh, I mean, once you're on the Supreme Court, I think they know much more, but most general lawyers don't know much about it. They What they know is case law. And even if they do know about the ratification and the original legal meaning and uh, the foundational principles behind the Constitution— they don't care. What they care about is what the court said, the Constitution to the courts— means under the doctrine of uh, precedent stare decisis means what the court tells us it means until the court changes its mind. But that, to the founding generation, is the definition of despotism. If a constitution is not fixed in its meaning, even though you can amend it, amend it that's different. But if it changes based on the opinions of judges, human beings, that is the definition of a tyranny. Tim Martin Always good stuff. All justices are politically connected and often constitutionally ignorant. After all, they're lawyers. I love you, man. Anyways, I hope you guys found this interesting. If you support the show, you like what we're doing. I did mention our membership program. If you can consider two bucks a month or up, of course, uh, over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members, I'd be extremely grateful for any support you can give us today. Of course, you can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Smash the like button on YouTube, Facebook, retweet on Twitter, all that stuff, leaving comments, sharing links. That will trigger the algorithm and tell them to show us to more people. It helps out a ton. Again, the membership program, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I really appreciate you being here. I will not be back tomorrow for Fast Friday, but I'm going to do a Fast Friday show on Saturday morning. So if you're available this weekend, I will see you at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Saturday morning. Thank you so much for watching the show. I really appreciate you being here. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.